Hey guys, this is John. So I wasn't planning on making a video today, but I played a very instructive over the board game just a couple hours ago in the Twin Cities Chess League, and I thought I'd share it with you guys. It's still fresh in my head. I have not looked at the game at all, and I thought I'd give you my unadulterated analysis. So what we're going to do is analyze the game first time through with no computer, as I think you should whenever you play a serious game. And then I'm going to upload the game to Lee Chess, and we'll get the computer's opinion. See where my inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders lie. And same thing for my opponent. And this is an important process to do. You've got to get used to analyzing on your own without the help of the computer. Resist the temptation to just flick on the computer immediately. That's why I'm doing this in two steps. So this is a team competition. This Twin Cities Chess League played on four boards. I was playing board one for the team called Niet. And I was actually just filling in for this match. I'm not a regular part of the team, but they had a couple members who were out of town. So I'm playing Andrew Titus, USCF rating of 2289, young player from here in Minnesota. I played him a few times already, and he opened with E4. Of course, I played Scandinavian, D5. <laughs> what else could you guys expect? Andrew took, took with a queen, knight C3, and queen D8. So I decided to go headlong into my repertoire on Chessable, the Queen D8 Scandinavian. And you'll see that we follow analysis from that repertoire for quite a few moves. Bishop C4. This is a flexible approach for white, so white is not committing the D-pawn yet. Black is best advised just to play knight F6, so I did that. Andrew played knight F3. And now I played A6. So this move looks kind of odd to the uninitiated, but you'll see my idea coming up. And at this point, white played d4. It's also possible for white to play knight e5. I tend to think this is a bit more threatening. You can see that white is intending bishop takes f7 mate. So this basically forces black to play e6, and that shuts in the light square bishop. There are a couple ways black can try to get counterplay from here, which I do analyze in that repertoire. But I think the fact that the bishop is locked in is a bit of a hindrance. And if you want my honest opinion, having looked at this for a few months now, I think white's a little bit better in this line. But Titus decided to play d4 right away. Now I go b5. He plays bishop b3, as white usually plays. I actually think it might be better for white to play the bishop to a different square, such as e2. I have seen some games where after bishop e2, white will try to go knight e5 and put the bishop on f3 and take aim against this rook on a8. But bishop b3 is very consistent, and he seemed to be expecting the line that I played. Even though there was virtually no time for preparation, he didn't waste much time in the opening. He was playing pretty quick, so it makes me think he's played this line from the white side before. So I go ahead and play c5. And this is the whole point of this a6, b5 operation. You get in c5, threatening to trap the bishop with c4, so white must take some action against that. And he took the pawn. I played a game last fall against uh, Grandmaster Sam Sevillon, where in this position Sevillon played a4, which is quite interesting. So giving the bishop some room to retreat back to a2 if black goes ahead and pushes c4. That game went b4, so I advanced and attacked the knight. Knight here, and then I just played e6, and I had a decent position out of the opening and was probably better going into the middle game. So that is another way for white to play, though a4 if they want to keep some pieces on the board. So after d takes c5, I can swap the queens. Queen takes d1. Andrew decided to take with the knight. King takes is also pretty harmless to black. So you see knight takes most, most often. And now e6, attacking the pawn on c5. So temporarily black is down a pawn, but I'm guaranteed to win it back. Mainly because white's bishop on b3 is blocking their b pawn from coming up to b4 and further supporting that pawn. White can defend the pawn once with bishop e3 as he played. But here, and those of you who have studied that repertoire will know this, there are three acceptable moves for black. So we want to try to develop and also win this pawn back. So we can play either knight fd7, knight e4, or bishop b7. Bishop b7 is a pretty nonchalant move. Black is, in effect, saying, you have no good way to bring about another defender on this pawn anyway, so I can afford to play a developing move with the idea of playing knight bd7 on the next move, hitting the pawn. The reason why you might want to insert bishop b7 if you choose that plan is because 
If you play knight bd7 right away, white can advance c6 with tempo on the knight. So black is best advised if they want to get the knight to d7, this knight to d7, to play bishop b7 immediately. I chose knight e4, though. And there's another game which I've also analyzed on this channel, also played in last fall, in the same tournament I played against uh, Sam Sevillon, just two rounds later, against international master Arthur Callagher, where I reached the same position with black. So I have some previous experience with knight e4. Black is lagging a bit in development, but the queens are off the board, so the pace of play tends to slow down when that happens. And I like my flexibility, too. I haven't committed my minor pieces on the queen side, so black can look forward to the future with confidence here. So Andrew Castled now. Again, he doesn't have a good way to defend his pawn on c5. On Chessable, I analyzed c3. I gave this as probably white's best chance. The idea being that after knight takes c5, white can save their light square bishop. They can play bishop c2. And this position, I think, is roughly equal. I know the computer thinks it's a tad better for white, but I remember when I, when I analyzed this for that repertoire, I really didn't think it was much for white. White probably should take this opportunity to save the bishop, though, because you'll see in the game that I snagged the bishop pair, and I think black can be fully satisfied with the result of the opening when that happens. So white castles, I take on c5. So I'm moving the knight again, but if I take with the bishop, that is not consistent with my goal of winning this light square bishop. So knight takes c5. I'm taking aim at the bishop on b3, and I definitely do not mind if white takes me. We'll just get a trade, and I'll get their dark square bishop. So one way or the other, I'm getting one of white's bishops. So now he connected his rooks, knight c3. And I played knight bd7. I thought about playing bishop b7 as well, so just bringing the bishop to this long diagonal. But I thought there might be a chance white would go knight e5 and just try to occupy the center. So with knight bd7, I'm trying to play bishop b7 on a coming move, but without allowing knight e5. Now you might ask, why am I not taking on b3? Didn't I just go through the spiel about how I want the bishop pair? And I do want the bishop pair, but I'm holding this bishop hostage right now. Right now. It can't go to any of these squares. They're all protected by my pawns. So I don't have to be in a rush to take it. It might be best to hold off on this capture to um, until a more opportune time when white has made some sort of concession or there's clearly a reason to capture. So if you have a knight holding a bishop hostage, don't feel like you have to take it right away and cash in. Sometimes you can benefit from holding off. So knight bd7. And now he plays rook fe1. These positions are a little hard to evaluate for some people because it looks like white is in decent shape, right? I mean, white is better developed than I am, no doubt about that. I've got two bishops that still need to come out. Also, I have my king, which could be a question mark. It is sitting in the center, whereas white's is safely tucked away on the king side. Sometimes black might keep the king in the center, but if white starts putting rooks on like e1 and d1, no doubt this king could be a liability. So... Why am I so confident about black's position here? Well, it's the fact that white doesn't really have any pawn action going in the center. Really no pawn action whatsoever. If we look at white's structure, all these pawns are sitting on their original squares. So really the only thing I have to worry about is white's piece play. But my position is too solid to be breached by piece play alone. Especially if I get the bishop pair coming up. Bishops are long-range pieces. They can participate in an attack from a distance. So, you know, like this bishop eyeing my pawn on e6 is something that I may like to uh, navigate by getting rid of that bishop. But it's just not possible for white to really land any solid blow if I am careful and just navigate white's ideas. But still, when he plays a move like rook fe1, I have to be careful because with the alignment with my king on e8, there might be some issues with knight d5 or bishop d5. And that's why at this moment I took on b3. So knight takes b3. I thought for a second about bishop b7, but this is where that alignment issue comes up. I thought maybe white can save their bishop or offer to trade it on better terms, bishop d5. The idea there being if e takes d5, white has this discovery, bishop takes c5 check. So just being cautious here after rook f e1, eliminate the bishop first. So knight takes b3. He takes with the A pawn. 
opening up the rook on the a6 pawn. Now white is threatening knight takes b5. You have to bear in mind, because this pawn is pinned. I would lose my rook on a8. So bishop b7 solves that issue. We defend the rook on a8. He plays bishop d4. This move didn't bother me, because he's trying to hamper my development by attacking the pawn, but I realized I can just move this bishop. So I played bishop e7. And white cannot take on g7, because after a rook to g8, and the bishop moves somewhere, let's say bishop back to d4, I have bishop takes f3, winning a piece. His g-pawn is pinned to his king. So bishop d4 was kind of an empty threat. Uh, I did have a brief think here about whether to play bishop e7 or bishop c5 and offer a trade of the bishops. I ultimately decided on bishop e7 because I thought if bishop c5, white might play knight e4. Taking an eye on this potentially weak d6 square. Like if I take on d4, maybe white can insert knight d6 check, fork on the king and the bishop. So I thought bishop e7 was safest of all. That also uh, ensures my king safety too. I mean, I had a pawn sitting on e6 against the rook on e1, but it doesn't hurt to put another piece there. And now Andrew played rook e3. So this reinforces the knight. He might have been fearful of me playing bishop takes f3 at some point and damaging his structure. Already, I think it's tough to do anything active for white. He is going to struggle to find like a truly um, aggressive way of continuing, again, because of the lack of pawn action white has. He's trying to breach my structure with just pieces, and as long as I stay solid, I don't think it'll happen. So I'm not exactly sure what he should do here. Maybe at some point he should play knight e5, which is a move he wasn't able to get in in the game. You could also just centralize the other rook, rook ad1. I thought this might be a possibility. The plan there is if I castle, he can play bishop takes g7, a little tactic, opening up the rook on d7. But I believe, had he done that, I was playing around with the idea of castling queenside. So overprotecting the knight on d7. And bishop takes g7 is still bad in view of rook g8. He's going to have that same issue with the knight hanging on f3. So I think I am well prepared to meet White's various ideas, including rook, AD, rook ad1. So he plays rook e3. I castle short. I could also castle long here if I want, but I saw a potential issue with knight takes b5. This is where White's rook on the third rank could prove handy. After a takes b5, he gets in rook c3 check. And if I run king b8, there's bishop a7, King here, and then bishop discoveries, like bishop c5 check, for instance. And I could be in trouble. Probably bishop b6 is even potentially good here. But with the rook on the third rank, no reason to castle queenside and expose myself to this. Although, actually, I wonder if I could play bishop takes f3 here. This is not a move I looked at during the game. I just assumed knight takes b5 was good for white. That way, if rook takes and take here, check... Yeah, my king is not as boxed in. There's no bishop on b7. However, and again, this is all without me checking it with the computer yet. Please bear in mind. So <laughs> I'm, I'll probably be prone to make some mistakes. That's just part of the process. However, after bishop takes f3, I think knight a7 might be working for white. Knight a7 check. King comes up. Take. This knight is kind of awkwardly placed, though. Maybe it's just it'll end up being trapped. Although I have to watch f7. White is attacking that pawn. This is a little messy. I don't like the look of this. Just because castling kingside is so safe, I don't think I need to make my life more complicated by analyzing the ramifications of this and knight takes b5. It's unnecessary. Had white played that rook ad1 move, I would have done this probably. But in this iteration of the same idea or similar idea, it's more dangerous for black. So anyways, castle's short. And this is a good moment to assess because I finally got my king to safety and completed my development. I think with the two bishops, I'm just somewhat better here. I mean, if I had to place an evaluation on it, I'd say black is about a half pawn better at this stage. It's very, very comfortable. In the long run, I think my bishops will take over. Also, I think white's structure on the queen side is potentially a little weak. 
One idea I have is to put a rook on c8 and try for b4, take aim against that pawn on c2. I also have this majority. It's important to keep in mind uh, a four pawn versus three pawn majority. And I was already thinking of ways I could activate that majority, especially by going f6 and e5 in the center. That could be a good way to attack some of white's pieces in the middle, that bishop on d4 in particular. So after I castled, white played knight e4. I'm not going to just trade my bishop for the knight for no reason. So here, I brought my rook over to c8, gaining a tempo on the pawn. Rook takes c2 threatened. Andrew played c3, guarding against that. And now I just brought my other rook over, rook fd8. Bringing more pieces into the fray. I was thinking about f6 as well. So again, trying to activate my pawn majority. But I did not like the look of knight g3. Threatening rook takes e6. And then if e5, white has knight f5. So doesn't have to move the attacked bishop, can just bring the knight up to threaten knight takes e7 check. And this is going to slow me down. I don't think it's necessary to go for this. Yeah, like if bishop d b bishop d8 here, knight d6 is possible. Although actually I can take here, can't I? Hmm. E takes d4. Maybe bishop d8 is actually decent in this position. Hmm. Yeah, another move I, I perhaps underestimated. I thought allowing knight f5 would be doing white a favor, but maybe not. Bishop d8 might just take the wind out of his sails. I think I missed that e takes d4 hits the rook on e3. So he doesn't have time for like knight takes b7. Hmm, this is definitely a moment I'll check with the computer. Because maybe I can accelerate this whole plan, f6. I end up playing f6 on the next move after rook fd8, but yeah, why not right now? Knight g3, e5. I mean, knight f5 is not necessarily forced here. White could also play the rook away, like rook e2, just to give this bishop some room to roam back to e3. Because one major thing I'm trying to do with f6 and e5, I know I mentioned attack white's minor pieces, but that bishop is on the verge of being trapped. With the rook on e3 and the pawn on c3, it's running out of flight squares backwards. So he might have to go through some contortions like this, as he did in the game, in order to save the bishop. But this might be like a slightly improved version of the game. I haven't had to play rook fd8. Not that rook fd8 is a bad move necessarily, but I am curious if I could have just played this f6 idea right away. So oversight on my part, knight f5, I think just bishop d8. And that bishop is not looking good. White can play bishop a7, but i got to believe this bishop is going to get trapped. Rook a8. Yeah, he's just running out of flight squares. He can play like this move maybe to attack the knight. But maybe just knight c, uh, bishop c6. Rook d6. It's a little murky. I still don't fully trust this whole idea. Like bishop a7 is a patently... Ridiculous move to have to resort to, but <laughs> hey, desperate times. Okay, so I'm going to check that with the computer for sure. So I played rook fd8. Andrew played b4. So with this move, he's trying to gain a foothold on the c5 square. This adds some stability to his structure. On the other hand, it present, presents a target with bishop takes b4, which could be useful if I ever want to deflect this pawn from c3, which is guarding his bishop. So now I play f6. I'm going to start rumbling in the center. And he plays knight g3. So one thing I was curious about here during the game, I was trying to calculate this, but um, you know the time control is game in 90 with a 5 second delay. It's a lot of time, but for an over-the-board tournament game, that's a time control where you know a good player will end up using a lot of that time. You know, I ended up using almost the full amount, actually. Um, with delay instead of increment, too, you never build up time. So the 30-second increment with game 90 is, is a different animal than delay 5, I think. So you're trying to make quicker decisions. You don't want to, like, delay a decision for, you know, an exorbitant amount of time. 
Although I did think for like five plus minutes at certain moments in this game. But I didn't quite calculate what would happen if white plays knight c5 here, at least the entirety of it, but I had a decent idea of what to do. So had white played this, let's check out what can occur. Because it seemed to me like this might be the most forceful way to try to deal with the whole e5 plan. By playing knight c5, white is attacking b7 and also e6. I can end up winning a pawn, or try to win a pawn. Like, let's say knight takes c5. But after bishop takes c5, bishop takes c5, b takes c5. If I just take on c5, white can take on e6 with a material equality. Maybe I have a tiny edge here just due to the bishop against the knight in an open position. I was trying to calculate what would happen here. It seemed a little bit better, but nothing special. One other thing I was looking at was if after bishop takes c5, I could just play a calm move here, like king f7. Bringing out my king to defend the dark square bishop and also defend the pawn on e6. But I don't know if I'm really any better here, especially if white gets in knight d4. Because one maneuver I have to watch out for when white has played the pawn to b4 is knight b3 to c5. If white could ever entrench that knight on c5, I might be hurting. From there, it would attack e6, b7, a6. And it's defended by the pawn. So, another version of this I was looking at, knight c5 taking with the bishop first. And again, white has to take with the bishop. They can't take with the pawn because of e5 and that bishop's a goner. Just trapped. I guess you could play a6 here, but it should be lost soon. So... Bishop takes c5, they'd have to play, bishop takes, and again, I think king f7 is a decent idea, king f7. Uh, oh yeah, I should mention also that if I go down this path again, so take, take, and now if I want to save this pawn by playing e5, white does get a chance to play b4 and prop up the pawn. So my, my tentative plan was to play king f7 in this position and go from here. And I still like the fact that this bishop was awkwardly placed. It's attacked twice. Now that I've defended my e6 pawn too, I'm not going to lose that if I go after the bishop on c5 and the pawn. And if bishop back to d4, I'm ready to play e5. I think I looked at white playing bishop d6 here. And I thought I could play knight b6 in this case, attacking the bishop. And it just seemed good. Like if bishop c5, knight a4 looks promising hitting the bishop, also attacking the pawn on b2. And if bishop back to, say, g3, I can always play e5 and try to shut that bishop out of the game. So that was the tentative plan if white ventured knight c5. That's a line I'll check with the computer, too. So instead, he played knight g3. White does have to clear some of these minor pieces out of the way. So knight g3, he's trying to eye that f5 square once more and open up the rook against the bishop on e7, which is undefended. I go ahead and play e5 here. And he plays rook e2. It was also possible to play knight f5 for white. But what was I thinking here if this had occurred? Oh, I think just bishop f8. Yeah, bishop f8. Guard the bishop. And now we're threatening to take this again and nothing to worry about on the e-file. Yeah, so knight f5 was not good. So not really a serious concern. So he played rook e2, trying to give the bishop a square to go back to on e3. And this was a key moment in the game. I spent some time on this next move, probably, I'd say at least 7-8 minutes. No, probably more than that. I, I might have spent close to 10 minutes on this move, trying to figure out what to do. So black to play. If you'd like to use this as an exercise for yourself, feel free to pause the video, try to figure out what I should do. Okay, so it felt like the correct time to try to cash in on the awkward nature of white setup. I definitely felt like I had achieved something with f6 and e5 pushing in the center. But there is this issue with my hanging bishop on e7, right? And if I take white on d4, he takes the bishop on e7. I can try to win a pawn like this, but I thought I'd be in for some hurting after like a move like rook d1. 
pinning my knight on d7. Can't move, move for fear of losing the rook on d8. Also, knight f5 is an issue that I always have to contend with. Simply threatening the pawn on g7. If g6, there's knight h6 check. Maybe even knight d6 in some cases. So purely going for the pawn in that fashion did not appeal to me. Nor did bishop f8, though. So dropping the bishop back to try to threaten bishop take uh, e takes d4. Because in this case, white can just play bishop e3 and they get that bishop to safety. Maybe I'm still better here with the two bishops, but there's nothing concrete. So I was looking at more complicated versions of eventually trying to take the bishop on d4. And what I decided upon was bishop takes b4. I was also looking at bishop takes f3, but bishop takes f3 is worse for a reason I'll show you in a second. Uh, but after bishop takes b4, the play develops by force. He takes the bishop. If he does anything else, I'll probably just be up a pawn. Or in the case of bishop takes e5, yeah, I'll probably still win a pawn even in this case due to bishop takes f3 in between move, attacking his rook. And then after g takes f3, knight takes e5, take here, I can take f3 check. And I've snagged a pawn with tempo. King g2, knight d4, hitting his rook on e2. And I think I'll have time to save my a6 pawn, which is under attack here. Yeah, I should have time to do that on the next move. Might even be possible to play. I think I looked at knight h4 check as well here. And then if king h3, knight here. And once more, white does not have time for this due to knight f4 check. Also, they can't play rook e6, trying to double attack this because of knight f4 check. Similar fork. So I calculated that. Bishop takes b4. If white does anything but take the bishop, I'm coming out at least a pawn ahead. So he plays c takes b4. And now I take on f3. Once again. So removing the defender of the bishop on d4. And hitting his rook on e2. G takes f3, and now e takes d4. So the reason why I didn't play bishop takes f3 first in this position, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and now I could play bishop takes b4 if I want. Without my bishop on b7, the pawn on a6 is not defended. So instead of going down the line with c takes b4, which would transpose to the game after e takes d4, white could just play bishop e3 here. Move the bishop back, whereupon he's threatening c takes b4. I have to take a moment to move my bishop away somewhere. And then he can go rook takes a6 and regain his pawn. So that was a small move order dy dilemma I had to solve. So bishop takes b4 first, keeping the bishop guarding the pawn on a6 for now. So all this happened in the game. Take. And I felt like I was much better here. Um, it's a messy position. There have been some exchanges, but the position remains messy. But the thing that stands out is how strong my d-pawn can be. It's only a few squares away from promotion. It's backed by my rook on d8. Also, my knight is ready to jump into e5. The other feature of the position that appealed to me is how weak white structure is. You can see he's just got pawn weaknesses galore. And yes, my pawn on a6 is hanging. And yes, he can do stuff that looks active like knight f5 and rook e7. But I think these long-term assets, um, maybe even short-term assets, they're pretty dangerous in the short term too, especially the D-pawn. Uh, I feel like that should give me a clear edge here. That was my feeling during the game. And I calculated some lines to back that up too. So Andrew played knight f5, which I think is a decent try. This is a double attack. He's threatening knight e7 check and also knight takes d4. Rook takes a6 on the other hand didn't concern me because I can just play d3 against this. And if white tries to block the advance of the pawn, rook d2, then knight e5, we're threatening knight takes f3. Also knight c4 is a threat. So if white comes up with a king to cover that, knight c4, rook here, knight takes b2, rook here, knight back to c4, here, d2, threatening this. This just looked very bad, if not outright losing for white. So... He can't just grab the pawn on a6 and hope to reestablish material equality and survive. Um, he's going to play for activity with knight f5, with those two threats. 
And I had to see in advance here that I have the move rook c4, which is what I played, which neatly solves the double attack problem. White's threatening knight e7, knight takes d4, rook c4, knight e7 is no longer a fork, and we're supporting this pawn. And again, if rook takes a a6, I think it's just too dangerous for white. d3, and once more, my knight will come up to e5. The rook being on c4 actually helps, too, because... In some cases, white might want to try to challenge my knight on e5 by playing f4, but we've got this rook patrolling the, the fourth rank very nicely. So after rook c4, Andrew played rook e7, invading. And here I had another long think. At first, when I was calculating this position from a distance, way back when I played bishop takes b4, I thought this would be a pretty easy win just by pushing my d-pawn now and not even really worrying about rook takes g7. But there's a tactical detail that did not occur in the game, but I wonder if he calculated, because um, I had to look at it and appreciate what this tactic was all about and find a way to navigate it, and that took a lot of time. Like, that took several more minutes for me to figure out. So, in this position, my candidate moves were d3, just pushing the pawn, uh, knight e5, and I think that's about it. I mean, I think I maybe briefly considered rook takes b4, but grabbing pawns right now is not in, really in the spirit of the position. It's very much like a hand-to-hand -hand combat position, both sides playing for the initiative. What's going to be stronger, my d-pawn or the threats he has against my king? So I don't really want to take a timeout to grab a pawn unless I, I feel the position is safe enough to do so. So d3 and knight e5 were basically the moves. Uh, g6, note, just trying to save the g7 pawn, does run into knight h6 check. And if king here, there's rook takes h7 or even rook f7 check. Yeah, probably this is the easiest. And now rook e1, knight e5, and f4. And I'm looking embarrassed down the e-file. So I can't really save the g-pawn. I think I also maybe briefly considered king h8 just as a prophylactic measure here against rook takes g7, but I didn't look at it too seriously. So I did eventually go with d3, just pushing the pawn. And white to move. See if you can anticipate how this will go. And also if you can find the tactic, which is a tactic for white, that white can attempt here, uh, then see if you can locate that. So white to move. How do you think this should go from here? All right, so since I haven't checked this yet, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this position is good for black. However, the tactic is pretty clever. So after rook takes g7, which was played, I go king h8. King f8, on the other hand, trying to run towards the center, is just going to be met by rook takes h7, whereupon he's threatening rook h8 check. I did look briefly at d2 here to see if I could play d2 and a quick rook c1. But after rook h8 check, king f7, rook takes d8, rook c1. Ah, oh, actually, this might be good. Hmm, for some reason I thought white was getting in rook takes d7 here very quick. But in fact, after king g2, I can just promote, can't I? I don't have to bother taking that rook on a1. Rook takes a1 is completely unnecessary, I can just promote. Hmm, that's a detail I missed. That I'm only seeing now in analysis. Maybe I can play king f8. King f8, rook takes h7, just push the pawn. I mean, granted, white has other moves here, though. Like, rook d1 is possible, isn't it? Just holding off on rook h8 for the time being. And then if rook c1, knight back to e3. Knight here. Check. King e7. Hmm. Take. Probably take here. This still looks good for black, though, doesn't it? The position has been simplified, though. Probably king g2 now, just so white can threaten. Rook takes d2. Note that the rook is pinned on the first rank. King d2. Eh, it's still a little messy, isn't it, though? Knight c4, maybe, at this stage? Ah. That might be winning. For black. Threat of knight takes e3 followed by rook takes d1. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's another line I'm going to use the computer to check out because I assumed King F8 was messy and unnecessary. Rook takes H7, but if D2 just wins, then that would be nice. Oh, what about uh, in this position? Rook H8 check, King here. And then instead of rook takes d8, which does run into rook c1, what about just knight d6 instead? Knight d6 check. Uh-huh. So then if I move my king, which I have to, so like king e7, let's say, uh, knight takes c4. I think rook takes h8 would be force, and then just knight takes d2 and whites up material in the final position. Okay, so maybe this line is not good for black, but for a different reason than I thought in the game. Yeah, that seems to be the case. So anyways, after rook takes g7, I played rook h8, uh, king h8. And now, <laughs> to answer the question that I posed to you guys, like how should the game continue, rook takes a6 is interesting for white. And I thought he would play it. I thought he would go ahead and try this move. It might not be that good for white, like, I, I still am betting on black here. But the point of this move is that if I just play d2 now, which looks incredibly obvious, white has this cute move. Rook takes d7. And if rook takes d7, I actually wind up losing. Rook a8 check. Knight on f5, guarding the g7 flight square. So all I could do is give up my rooks like this, and I get mated. So if this position came to pass, rook takes d7... I'd have to either promote here or play rook c1 and then promote. Playing rook c1 changes almost nothing. Check, king g2. I still can't take on d7 due to rook a8. So we'd wind up getting a position like this. But then rook takes here, and whichever rook I take with... Actually, I have to take with this rook, don't I, to keep this rook on the back rank. Now he can go scoop up this pawn. And white has, what, three pawns and a knight for the exchange? So... White's probably not even worse here at all. Black might be the one struggling. So remember, we have to see this way back when we're deciding to play d3 or not. So when I played that move, I had to anticipate rook takes g7 followed by rook takes a6. Now what I was planning on rook takes a6 is to go knight e5. And I didn't get a chance to ask Andrew after the game if he calculated this, or if he saw rook takes d7 or what, or if he was scared of knight e5. But I'm banking on this move as being good for black. So now there's no rook takes d7 issue. And I'm just trying to run with the d-pawn, quite simply. Also, knight takes f3 might be something white has to worry about. But even here, I had to make sure that I had enough in the tank to win the position. Because white could double up the rooks on the 7th rank. So rook a a7. Threatening mate in 3, I believe. Rook takes h7, king g8. Rook a to g7, king f8, and then rook here. So let me just show that. Like if d2, white gets there quicker than I do. Checkmate. Notice again the role of the knight on f5, supporting the rook on g7. But the move I was banking on here, again, should this position have occurred, is rook g8. A passive move to have to play, but a very timely one. Forcing a trade of the rooks. Rook takes h7, checkmate would be nice, but it's illegal. White's king is on g1. And I figured after take and king takes, I still have my very dangerous d-pawn. I still have my knight poised to attack f3. It would be nicer if I had a rook on d8 supporting the d-pawn, but my rook on c4 will do. And with just a rook and a knight left and no mating threats in sight, I think black should be clearly better if not winning this position. It might just be a straight win. Probably is. Because if ever white has to go into defensive mode here to try to stop the pawn, I think he's just going to lose quite quickly. Like, let's say knight e3 is played. I can just play d2. Rook, knight takes c4 is not a threat due to queening. Yeah, and I'm threatening rook c1. If this rook comes back, check. Wins the game. So, this is a conclusion I'm going to check out with the computer. I hope that I was right that knight e5 is good for black in this position. But it comes down to a tempo in some lines, like with this line with rook a7, and then rook g8. d2 being a nice attempt, but getting mated. White gets their one tempo, 
faster than we do. Don't know if white can do much else after rook g8. White probably should take my rook. Take, take, and... Again, I didn't analyze too closely from here, but just my gut instinct is white can't stop the d-pawn and, and black's active pieces. Which is interesting, because white is up a pawn here, aren't they? If we do a quick material head count, I have four pawns, white has five. But these pawns are discounted. They're double isolated. And again, the d-pawn is just such a monster, supported by the aggressive knight and the rook. So, as played in the game, though, after rook takes g7, check king h8, Andrew played rook g4, which I was very happy to see. I had spent a lot of time figuring all this out. I was getting somewhat close to time pressure. I probably had, like, 20 minutes left at this point. So, I was very happy to see rook g4, because I knew my king was going to be pretty safe. I played knight e5. This move was just begging to be played. Open up my rook on d8, get the knight to a good square. Also attacks the rook. So he takes, and I decided to take with the knight. Kind of tempting to take with the pawn too, but I think knight takes is better. I'm hitting the pawn on b2, and I'm also supporting d2. Now he plays king f1, trying to hurry the king over in uh, hopes of a defense, but I'm not sure white has a real good alternative, really. Uh, the d-pawn is running. White can't really pause to play b3 and hope to kick my knight because I'm just responding with d2, threatening promotion. And if rook d1 is played, knight b2 is lights out. So king f1, I played knight takes b2. Knight back to e3, white has to come back and defend. Yeah, like rook takes a6, again, white has no time to do this due to d2, pawns pushing on through. Notice how my king has been completely secured by the exchange of one pair of rooks, by the way. Um, I mean, there is still that mechanism with the knight on f5 and a rook threatening to come down to a8, but with this rook standing on d8, there's no threat to my king. I'm completely safe. So Andrew played knight e3, trying to observe that d1 square. And starting from here, I began looking at ways to try to force a win. Because I saw that I could take the game to a pawn endgame. And it's a pawn endgame that I think is probably winning, even in this form. But I wasn't quite sure. And the pawn endgame I'm referring to is d2, threatening to promote. And if white plays king e2, then just playing d1 queen. Giving up the pawn, but getting to this endgame after this fourth series of trades. It's equal material, but again, these double isolated F pawns are discounted. And even though my A pawn is backward for the moment, it can't go to A5, black has this simple plan of just marching all the way over to B6 and playing A5 and freeing up a pass pawn on the queen side, trying to make the B pawn pass. But my king is a little far away. Um, if we were to explore this endgame, like say king G7, king E2, king F7, king here, king here, King f4, probably a good move for white. I would have to calculate this out. And at the time, I didn't want to take a risk. I saw I could go for this endgame pretty much whenever I like. Not whenever I like, but I could wait a move or two and decide to do this. So what I ultimately did way back here, instead of playing the direct d2, I just played king g7 in preparation for that coming endgame. I didn't really see anything active white could do. So I figured I can just keep d2 in my back pocket. No problem. Like we're going to play this on the next move. Or maybe two moves from now. And by the way, if I play d2, uh, white could try knight to d1, I believe. If they want to try to keep the position out of a pure pawn endgame. But I was thinking of a couple different things against this. One idea I had was to play rook c8. So that if knight takes b2, there's rook c1 check. This familiar idea. And black just wins here. The other idea is to play after knight takes d1. So agree to the knight trade. Rook takes d1 and now go rook d4. And we'll get a position like this where I take the b pawn, he takes the d pawn. White's down one pawn. 
usually not so bad in a rook end game but again the fact that these pawns are doubled this is what dooms white white can't hold this position my a and my b pawns are too strong i'll just start pushing them probably get my king up to uh g6 first king g7 king g6 so there's those are some other possible scenarios if after d2 white tries to avoid uh d1 queen but as I was saying, I just played king g7 because I figured I had time to do it. Didn't see anything active white could do. d2 is still coming next move. Still don't really see anything active white could try. Again, if knight d1, I can play in similar fashion. I could just trade and then play rook d4. And even if white defends this, rook b1, d2, king e2, queen the pawn, take, take. Black will win this endgame, no problem. So king g7, he ended up playing king e1, trying to get the king to d2, but here's where I can play d2 check. He goes king e2, and now just with um, you know my less than 10 minutes remaining on the clock, I spent a little bit of time just making sure that this pawn end game we're about to reach is a win. So always good to do when you're making a big, potentially game-altering decision, um, and when you're transitioning to a pawn end game in particular, you have to be absolutely clear about what the result of the game will be or have a very good idea because pawn end games are the clearest type of end games that we can calculate. And that's why you hear teachers and um, chess books, end game books harp on the importance of pawn end games because you really got to know your stuff in them and they can often be calculated out to a, a result, a win or a draw. It's just a matter of persistence. There's no other pieces on board to complicate the scenarios. No rooks or minor pieces or queens or whatnot. So buckle down and calculate those pawn end games. So I queened, giving up the D pawn, but it's worth it to transition to this end game where uh, we have that plan, once again, of bringing the king over to B6 and pushing A5, unlocking our queenside majority. So I played king F7, king here, king up, king here, King d5. A couple different ways white could play this, uh, but it doesn't make a great difference whether he brings the king to any of these squares. My plan will be the same. So here, king d5. And now I played king d3, just playing a little defense, trying to keep me out of the c4 square. But if king f4, I'm just going to go for the b pawn in this case. I will not go king here, king here, and a5 because king c4 is just much quicker. King c4, king f5, king takes, king takes here, king c3, f4. And as we can see in this race scenario, black just gets there one square before white does, f7. This is going to be a win for black. We'll start checking white's king, and we also even have the a pawn if we need to resort to that. But that variation, by the way, like that demonstrates why I played king g7 way back when. I wanted to gain a tempo with my king, and if I can go into this endgame with my king one step closer, then that's fine by me. I'd, I'd love to see that, versus trying to force the issue too soon by playing d2 when I wasn't quite sure um, and didn't want to spend the time to figure out if that extra tempo was going to matter. If I did have more time, if I had like 30 minutes or something, I probably would have calculated if d2 was winning in this position. So again, fast forwarding. At this point, he did play king d3, trying to stop me from going king c4, but king c6, king e4. If white just waits, then, you know, like king c3, king b6, king b3, a5, take, take. Now I'll win just by pushing the b pawn. And probably at some point, I will abandon the b pawn and go after his f pawns. So that's the fox and the chicken coop idea if any of you are familiar with that. So after after king c6, he decided to go towards my pawns. King e4, king b6, f4. Now it's just a race, a5. But I had already calculated that I'm ahead by two tempi in this race. King here. It's awkward for white because they have to go up, win the f pawn, and then their own king is blocking the uh, f pawn from advancing. Meanwhile, my B pawn is advancing unimpeded. So this happened. 
I queen first, f6. And now I just kept it simple. White's pawn is two squares away from promotion. So what I could do is try to check him a bunch of times and get really close with my queen. And then at some point start bringing my king over. But I saw a straightforward way to win this by playing queen e1 check, forking the king in the pawn. King f8. He doesn't want to go to f7 because that would just block his f pawn anyways. So king f8. Queen takes f2. This does allow f7, but now I go and scoop up the h pawn. Queen takes h2. He goes king g7, trying to get out of the way to queen. But queen f4. And white's big problem is, of course, if he promotes, then I just trade queens and run with my h pawn. And he cannot stop this pawn. Go down, get a queen, mate with king and queen against king. And I think that's important to note because, especially when time is a factor, you know, there's no increment here. I didn't want to have to stress myself out calculating, like, okay, how many checks do I give with my queen? And at what point do I start bringing my king back over to try to help out? Nah, it's just much easier to do this, in my opinion. Uh, scoop up this pawn, scoop up the h pawn by force. Notice this is a double attack on f6 and h2, so white doesn't really have any choice. And you get no points for, um, you know, keeping an extra queen. No extra points, that is, in the cross table. <laughs> a win is a win, so even though he does get to queen in this line, we're getting another queen very soon. So what happened in the game is after I played this queen f4 move, he actually played the, the cheeky move king h8. Good try. I would have done the same if I were him. And his point is that if I play queen takes f7, that is unexpectedly stalemate. No legal move for white. So I just made sure to throw in queen f6 check, whereupon he resigned. I'll be uh, just up a pure queen very soon. And yeah, nothing for white to do. So 50 move game. And a real fun one to play. There were some key decisions in this. And an end game that was reached that uh, I think is practical for almost anyone. You know, upon end game, calculating the ramifications of this D1 check, D2 and D1 check, giving up a pawn, but taking the game into a equal material end game, but one where White's F pawns doom him, the doubled F pawns. It's basically white, like White's down a pawn here because those pawns never play, whereas I do have potential to unlock my A pawn. And my king is pretty fast, too. It can come to the center and over to the queen side quite quickly. The real tactical battle in this game occurred right here when I made the decision to play bishop takes b4. So I'm going to double check what's going on in this position. I feel pretty good about my calculations, but you never know. There might be something like in, like say, this position in particular where I was analyzing rook takes a6 with the idea of rook takes d7. That sneaky resource if black gets greedy and plays d2. But I think knight e5 is still good for black. And even though after rook a a7, d2, uh, no, sorry, not d2, <laughs> rook g8, even though after all this I'm down a pawn, I like my d pawn and my aggressive uh, knight and rook. I would take black in this case. I think white might just be losing here. So let me go ahead and put this into Lee Chess next. The final step, looking at it with a computer. Don't make that your first step, just a reminder. And what I'm going to do, this always gets tricky when I'm switching windows in a video. If I had better editing skills, I could, I could do this no problem. But let me put up the Lee Chess window. So you guys are staring at a blank screen, but one second. There we go. Okay, so the Lee Chess analysis is in progress right now. Tried to make the window big enough just so you can see the inaccuracies, mistakes, blunders for both sides. Well, this is promising so far. Lee Chess is grinding away, but it hasn't found any inaccuracies, mistakes, or blunders for me yet. Or maybe it's just tabulating whites first. I don't know. <laughs> I 
found one inaccuracy. I think it works backwards forward. As you can see, it's, it's generating the computer analysis here and it's working towards the first move. And as I mentioned, these first like 12, 13 moves were all known to me. Um, so don't expect that there's going to be much of a problem with the beginning of the game. Okay, there you have it. So three inaccuracies, two mistakes, two blunders for my opponent for a 44 average centi pawn loss. And it looks like a pretty clean game, at least by these metrics, for me. One inaccuracy, zero mistakes, zero blunders, 21 average centi pawn loss. And given that Stockfish hates the Scandinavian, Stockfish on Lee Chess at least, I will take that average centi pawn loss of 21. <laughs> okay, so let me just flip this board. And let's check our work. I'm going to skip the opening. So again, I'm very confident in all this. And once again, if you're interested in this opening, check out my Scandinavian repertoire on Chessable. I analyze all of this and much, much more. Link is in the description. So, yeah, I think the, the advantage started working in my favor right around here. And that seems to be the case, according to what the computer says, too. Like, once I get in knight takes c5, I'm guaranteed to win the bishop pair. I'm feeling pretty good about this. The engine wants to go c4 here for white. Do something really drastic. Knight takes b3, a takes b3. Try to open up the position a little bit maybe while I'm underdeveloped. I mean, I do have all these pieces on the back rank, so that does make some sense. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if white wants to uh, truly inconvenience me, they have to do something quick before I settle in with the bishop pair and the better pawn structure. It's a tough thing because a lot of these moves that Andrew plays, like they look fine, but they're they're not concrete enough. He's not landing any threats with these moves. Like they're kind of just um, I don't want to call them autopilot moves necessarily, but they're a little superficial upon deeper analysis. So rook f e one here. I took on b three. Bishop e seven is also fine. Okay, but all this looks good. Bishop b seven guarding against knight takes b five. And here, rook c8 is a decent move. That was not one of my candidate moves. Rook c8, so threatening b4. Hmm. That's intriguing. Hmm. You know what I'm going to do, actually? I'm just going to make this window a little smaller because there's some dead space I see that you guys probably don't really care about. We're just going to condense this, make the board bigger. There we go. So, yeah, rook c8 on move 15. Intriguing. Not even developing my bishop yet. But I feel okay about bishop e7. And here the best move, according to the engine, is rook e to d1. Probably again with... Um, that bishop takes g7 threat in mind. Like, again, I can't just castle here due to bishop takes g7, and he's on my knight on d7. Rook e d1's a little odd, though, doesn't it? Kind of looks weird. Moving the rook again after it went to e1. Could I castle queenside in this case? Knight e1, maneuvering. That's a very computer-like plan. <laughs> Odd-looking plan. f6, just blocking bishop takes g7. I think I would still take black here, although... Maybe white has better chances than in the game. It could take some weird rearrangement like this to, to truly get white's position working the way he wants. He played rook e3 at castled. And knight e4, already the advantage is creeping up to uh, a full point for black after knight e4. It's surprising. And even still, if white plays rook d1, it's still clear advantage. Knight e4. Okay, yeah, this was a, um, a decision I was wondering about. So I played rook a c8. I recall thinking about rook f c8. Yeah, I had some doubt as to which rook to use. I ultimately went with the a rook because it looks like the more normal one. But maybe the idea with this is to keep a6 overprotected in some lines and also prepare like f6 and e5 really quick. So how would this go? c3? Yeah, again, f6, trying to push in the center. Knight here. 
King F7. Okay, so just guarding the bishop. Hmm. And this is apparently better than if I had played Rook A C8. Maybe we'll find out. But that was my one inaccuracy of the game, according to the computer. Rook A C8, like a very natural move. Hmm. So let's explore why that is. C3. So here, F6 is the best move. Okay. So remember how I was saying I didn't like F6 because of knight G3. And then if E5, knight F5. And I I was looking in the postmortem there I just did on chess base at bishop D8. And this does seem to favor black. Bishop A7 is forced for white. But maybe it's not as easy to trap the bishop as it looks. Rook C7. Hmm, yeah. I was looking at rook a8 here, wasn't I? Rook d3, attack the knight. This is getting very weird. Bishop here, saying take the knight because I'm going to take here. There's like multiple hanging pieces. Yikes. So is the difference between these lines just the fact that when I play rook fc8 and keep the other rook that there's no bishop a7? Like, is that the whole point? I'm just trying to understand... What the big difference is so if i play rook fc8 back here c3 f6 knight g3 e5 or king f7 yeah well in this case if knight f5 bishop here that would justify it right like that would be consistent with what i just described now bishop a7 is not possible but i guess technically yeah white could move the rook away somewhere like rook e2 or rook e1 Rook e1. And now the engine wants to go a5 and try to press on the queen side. Still seems a little abstract to me why rook fc8 is best, but I am glad that I at least thought about the two during the game. I was trying to appreciate the difference. Hmm. This is why chess is so fascinating, guys. Like, just these little subtleties, like rook fc8 versus rook ac8. Uh, I like the fact that even, tw like, 20 years into my chess career, Little things like that can still fascinate me. Hmm. Yeah, so I should have played f6 here. I think there's no doubt about it. Like that whole line with White's bishop coming to a7, that looks very awkward for him. On second glance, I wouldn't have minded playing that. Still, rook fd8, I'm, I'm probably doing well with f6 coming a move later, but maybe it gives White some chances. Okay, this is one moment I did want to check, right? whether knight c5 or bishop c5 was working here for white. This is where white played knight g3, and it seemed like the position began trending in my favor. So if knight c5 or bishop c5, computer likes this better. Hmm. Maybe that's to avoid the variation I was looking at. Uh, if knight c5, bishop takes, bishop takes, and then e5 or king f7. I think I was looking at king f7, guarding the e7 square. And I, I was describing how white's bishop is awkward. Yeah, and this does seem to be a bit better for black. Still not so much, but some edge. But knight c5 on the other... Or, uh, bishop c5 on the other hand. Yeah, maybe there is a little bit of a difference there. Bishop takes, knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes. Mm. And this gets into that end game where I wasn't sure that black really had anything. Like, if rook takes c5, rook takes e6, it's probably just real close to equal. Half pawn edge to black. I would still try to play this for a win, but... Maybe that's white's best bet, if he can try to force this. Oh, and here there's even knight d4. Wow. So white does not need to play rook takes e6. White could play that first. Threaten knight takes e6. Try to win the pawn back in better fashion. Note that if ever bishop d5, a6 is also very loose. <laughs> Some cool stuff going on here. Yeah, so if there's one area of this game where I bet I can improve, it's probably right around here. Maybe rook ac8 and rook fd8 is a little bit too routine. And I got to get an f6 quicker. Fortunately, though, he didn't challenge me. He played that knight g3 move, whereas putting a piece on c5 would have been better. Here, I go ahead and play e5. Again, the computer likes king f7, but e5 seems consistent too. Rook e2, and the engine does not like that move. 
It says rookie one is better by almost a full pawn. Yeah, that might be because in some of these lines that come up, uh, the I can play d3 with tempo on the rook. Also, bishop takes f3 comes with tempo against the rook. So even though rook e2 on the surface seems like the better move, keeping the rook more active, like guarding the b2 pawn, yeah, I can totally see why rook e1 is the best attempt. And now if bishop takes b4, if we go down this line, like take... Hmm... Bishop e3, what if I just come back here? Knight f5, uh-huh. And I've got these threats to worry about once again. White as compensation, according to the computer. So that's not something I noticed in the analysis either, the importance of rook e2 versus rook e1. A lot of times when you're conducting analysis, like you're more biased in looking at your own resources, for obvious reasons. And you don't spend as much time like analyzing what your opponent could have done better. And this is a good example right here. Like I didn't even mention the fact that rookie one is also possible and might just very well be better over rookie two. Okay, and bishop takes b4 looks good here. Yep, bishop takes b4. Actually best, according to the engine, is bishop takes e5. And I was mentioning the following line that I thought would work out in my favor. All this, and then I was saying either knight check or knight d4. Kind of like knight check. Idea king h3, knight back to g6 with this idea. Okay, so some validation here. Yep, computer's liking my tactical play where I snag a pawn. Knight f5 is white's best attempt. And is it going to say rook c4? Yes, there we go, rook c4. All right. Rook e7, also best for white. And d3, okay, also justified. Rook takes g7, best. King h8. And he played the best move here too, rook g4. Okay. Yeah, it feels like rook takes a6 is the critical move here, but it may just be bad after knight e5, so let's explore. Rook takes a6. And just to confirm, d2 is not so good view in view of this. And I can queen, force white to give this up, but I face a long slog here trying to win this position, I think. Rook all the way back to d8 to guard. He gets my f6 pawn. I can take here. Mm, I guess I am going to win b2 in this case, but I don't want to go down this road all the same. So, yeah, if rook takes a6, I was probably going to play knight e5. Ooh. Rook a7. What did I miscalculate? Check. What about my rook g8 move? Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't like to see that when it just immediately goes up. Okay, so what did I miss here? Take, take. I was espousing the... Oh, wow. Yeah, I just missed a tactic. I was espousing the virtues of my position despite being down a pawn. I was, like, describing the past d-pawn and my active knight and rook. And I overlooked that after this. White has check forking the king and the rook, ultimately. Ooh. That would be a nasty surprise had this position actually occurred. But I can throw in rook c1 check, can't I? This is all assuming knight e5 is played followed by rook a7. I can throw in this check, king g2, and what about rook g8 now? Take, take. Check again. I gotta go here. Uh, and he gets behind the pawn. Okay. And now without my rook on c4, f4 is annoying. I'm trying to force away the knight from guarding the pawn. And I'm only marginally better, if at all, here. Now it's down to equal. Ah, so that's a bummer, because, again, even though none of this occurred in the game, I, I still want to check my analysis. And going forward with knight e5, looks like there was a flaw in that, mainly because I missed that whole knight d6 move. However, because we're just trying to get to the truth of the position, the best move is knight f8. You know, that crossed my mind, knight f8 guarding the h7 pawn, but knight e5 was so appealing, I didn't take it as seriously as I probably should have. Yeah, and I guess knight on f8, there is no mate, as the old saying goes, and I'm just ready to push Derek the d-pawn. Yeah, rook takes here is not going to change anything. d2, there's just no mate threats, especially with the knight on f8. So best, according to the computer, is rook f7, d2. Yeah, he's probably just going to have to give up the knight, right? We promote with check, take, 
And I should be able to navigate this home. Bring the rook back to d8. Yeah, black should win this position. I only have two pawns left. And for the moment, he does have three pawns for the piece. But again, remember how weak all these pawns are. They're just going to drop like flies in the endgame. Mm, okay. Very interesting piece of analysis right there. And thank you if you've stuck with this video this whole way. I know um, I'm indulging myself with some of this analysis, but I'm just trying to show you guys what like the process of really thoroughly analyzing a game is like. And if I were to be even more thorough, I'd probably come back to this game in a couple more days, maybe a week from now, and um, try to even refine some of my conclusions further. A lot of times when you're looking at a game, especially an interesting one, it's not just a one-and-done analysis. You might return to it time and time again. So props to Andrew for finding rook g4 here. i got to ask him next time I see him if he was looking at rook takes a6, which seems to backfire in view of knight f8, but I don't know if I would have found that move. I might have just gone with knight e5 in the game. So as played, let's see if how the computer likes the play from this point forward. So approves of all this. King f1. Yep, take the pawn here. All right, there you go. It likes king g7 as well. Also likes rook d4. So what if I go for d2 right away? Let's just compare that here. Queen the pawn. Ah, I could also play king g7 here. That's just a transposition, isn't it? Uh, although, in this case, white didn't have to play king e1, king e2. Let's just check this ending, though, real quick. Take, take. This is the ending I wasn't sure about if we go into this. So my king is one square further back. Here, king e2. King h6 is good, or the recommendation coming up the side. What if I just play normal and come up this way? Yeah, white beats me to the punch in the center. You know how in the game I got to d5? Here white's getting to e4 before my king comes up to d5. Maybe I'm still winning, though. f5 check. What if I just go this way? King f5, uh, a5. Okay, so I can play a5 without bringing my king over in a lot of cases. Yeah, this makes sense. Here. I probably don't want to play b4 because then he might come back. But even this might be winning, interestingly. Yeah, we're shouldering the enemy king, keeping him out of, like, the d4 square. Huh. So, it looks to me like this endgame is still winning, even with my king back on h8, one square away. Even though the computer says equal right here. Don't be fooled because this is a common thing. Like when you play out an endgame, uh, the computer starts to change its evaluation. Still wants to play f5 check, but I don't see anything wrong with just king d6 here. Let's play this out though, just to be absolutely certain. King f5, a5, take, king c6, just get in the square of the pawn. Well, I technically was already in the square. But yeah, if white takes here, again, my b-pawn is too fast. So, yeah, this does appear to be a win. King e4. Yeah. If he ever comes back with the king, we're just going to win no problem. And just to demonstrate how that fox and the chicken coop thing might work. So, if we just follow some of the analysis here. At some point, I'm basically going to say, go ahead and take my b-pawn white if you want. Uh, let's say after these moves are exhausted. F5, F3. King here. And I'll just go here. Not really mining if he comes up here, because I'm going to go take all these guys and win. And if king d2, we're going to force him to come back and monitor the pawn. And then, again, we're getting at all the pawns, all the chickens with our, our fox. Okay, so king g7 may be unnecessary, but it is computer approved. It doesn't change anything, really, and can only benefit me. So it gives me a nice buffer if I, if I had miscalculated that endgame. Yeah, I don't think white can really do much here. Rook a2 is the best move. Yeah, that might keep it out of a pure pawn endgame for now, but probably doesn't change the evaluation much. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I could have forced things with d2 followed by d1, that would be more clear-cut than this, right? If I have to play knight a4 and keep the position with rooks and knights on board. So it may be the case that purely from... A practical standpoint, it is best to go d2 right here if that endgame is winning. But, Or maybe not from a practical perspective, but um, objectively, if d2 is a win, it's the best move, is what I'm saying. And I, I maybe shouldn't 
play king g7. Yeah, rook a2 is interesting. I don't think I thought about rook a2. I thought about rook b1. On rook b1, attacking the knight, I was going to play knight c4, threatening knight d2, which I thought was very good for me. But on rook a2, knight a4, king e1, yeah, white's kind of stuck here, and I'm up a pawn, but there were, there's still some loose ends to tie up before I win this position. Maybe at some point I do this and try to just win his b-pawn. Can't do it yet, though, because of knight f5. So that's probably why the computer likes king g6. So yeah, as played in the game, king e1, d2 check. Now there's absolutely no doubt. <laughs> Here again, king g6, the computer wants to play. But now I'm not going to back down from this. Probably also sees a win by just going after the h-pawn, I'm guessing. Or maybe it just wants to come up this way. King g6, king f5. Let's just see, just out of curiosity. Okay, yeah, it does want to push towards the queen side. Same thing. So f4 is a better try for white here. But I really don't think it'll matter. King d5 threatening king c4. King here. Yeah, I could play f5 if I want, try to keep the king out. Although I was mostly going to keep this pawn back to make it harder for white to go attack it. But I think this is still winning, right? King here. Yeah, we're still ahead in this race. Nothing has changed. So even though it says king e3 mistake, it's, I mean, don't count that as a mistake. It's, it's everything's losing for white. Yeah, and this is, this is over. Again, like computer says king e4, blunder. It really makes no difference. Like if we follow the computer's line, let's just play the computer recommended moves. It's still going to be a win for black. You can see already the evaluation is creeping up. So that is one thing that um, is annoying analyzing with engines. Like they sometimes consider stuff that's a, to be a mistake when it's really not. Again, I'm just kind of playing this all out to, to show you. But Fox on the chicken coop again. The king's going to work its way back over. Yep, all over from here. Mate in 27 has been calculated. Surprised I didn't consider my uh, idea of scooping up all the pawns to be a mistake. <laughs> Maybe it's good. Maybe it's the most efficient way to get this done. Okay. So there you have it. Um, an OTB game played at a time control of game and 90 with a five second delay that I played just mere hours ago and analyzing it raw on my own. That's very important to do. I cannot stress that enough. You've got to go through that step if you want to improve your chess. And only then using the engine, like using the engine just to check your conclusions and refine those conclusions too. Um, that's that's the way I go to go about it, guys. Like I know sometimes you don't have the time to do all this, and it's just so so tempting to just immediately put the engine on, immediately throw it in chess base, throw it in lee chess, wherever. But um, try to follow this process that I just demonstrated for you guys. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, this lengthy video. Let me know if you have any questions about this game, and I'll try to answer in the comments. All right, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.